Hi, I'm Chris. This is the first video describing my efforts to implement a floating point unit using Verilog. I'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining Boolean mathematics, but if you're reasonably comfortable knowing how to use the bitwise operators in C style programming languages, you shouldn't have any trouble keeping up with the discussion. If you're not familiar with the basics of digital logic, there is an excellent series done by LBE Books, which I'll have linked in the comments below. In that series, they're using VHDL as their hardware description language rather than Verilog, but all of the concepts carry over, and I think it's an excellent introduction to digital logic. Before getting into the actual content of this video, I want to take a few moments to give a preview of where I think this video series is heading. This series will be covering technical material. I hope to keep the details to a minimum, but for the Verilog code to make sense, you'll have to wade through at least some of the minutiae. Hopefully I'll strike the right balance, but if or when I fail, please feel free to say so in the comment section below. While I'm talking about details, the Verilog code will be developed in stages. I will start with the simplest implementation I can manage. In some cases, I may knowingly write code which doesn't conform to the standard just to get something working early. My goal is to keep each individual video under 10 minutes, but I offer no guarantees. At a minimum, I want to implement enough of the standard using Verilog that the remaining portions could be implemented in software. I hope to also write Verilog implementations of some of the higher level operations such as square root. I want to talk about testing strategies, and I will try to have finished Verilog code which complies with the standard. Which brings the discussion to why I'm doing this series and my credentials. What are my credentials? The short answer is none, or at least I don't have any of the traditional credentials. I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm a total Verilog newbie, and I've never been paid to design hardware. On the contrary, I'm a software guy. I have an aversion to opening computer boxes and mucking around with hardware, which is why I tell people up front I'm not screwdriver qualified. At this point, it's beginning to sound like I don't know what I'm doing and that this video is going to be a complete waste of your time. Don't run off just yet. After high school I got my degree in mathematics. This gave me a foundation in formal logic, a portion of which includes Boolean logic. Boolean logic is the foundation for digital logic. I've written a lot of code which required detailed knowledge of the underlying hardware. Much of computer science training is about abstracting the details away and working with high-level constructs. In spite of this, there's still a need for a programmer to deal with the low-level details, and for much of my career, I've been that guy. This often required working with electrical engineers to spec circuits so that the circuits are built right the first time. It also required that when things failed, I had to be able to communicate with the designers in their language to unravel the source of the problem. Starting in college and continuing on into the early part of my career, most of my programming projects were related to various math and physics problems. This meant two things. The first is that I spent most of my time writing code in the Fortran programming language. The second is that most of the calculations involved using floating point numbers. Consequently, I've always wanted to learn the details of how floating point hardware works. In case you don't already know, floating point numbers are the binary analog to scientific notation. Scientific notation, of course, is a convenient way of dealing with both very large and very small numbers. Relative to integers, floating point numbers trade digits of precision for an increased range of magnitude. In this video, I'm going to be working with 16-bit floating point numbers. For 16-bit signed integers, the values we can use range from about minus 33,000 to plus 33,000, and we can do so with up to five digits of precision. The smallest non-zero value which can be represented by an integer is one. The largest integer we can use is about four and a half orders of magnitude larger than the smallest integer. By treating those same 16 bits as a floating point number, at best we have only three digits of precision. But look at what happens to the range of magnitudes. The largest number we can represent is about 65,500 or 6.55 times 10 to the fourth power. Without losing precision, the smallest non-zero number we can represent is about 6.10 times 10 to the minus fifth power. 
This is a span of about nine orders of magnitude. If we're willing to give up more precision, we can span 12 orders of magnitude. When I started programming, every computer manufacturer had its own format for how floating point values were stored. Since then, the IEEE, that is the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers, published standard 754 for floating point numbers in 1985. This standard was revised in 2008 and again in 2019. It describes floating point formats for binary and binary coded decimal. The IEEE standard describes four binary floating point formats for 16, 32, 64, and 128 bit operands. All of the formats consist of three parts, a sign bit, an exponent field, and a significant field. In addition to encoding normal numbers, the standard includes methods for encoding zeros, quantities which are not a number, infinities, and something called subnormals. Let's take a look at how the IEEE standard encodes these different types of data using the 16-bit format as an example. As mentioned earlier, each floating point number encoded according to the IEEE standard has three fields. The sign bit is the most significant bit. For the 16-bit floating point format, it's bit 15, where the least significant bit is numbered as zero. Next is the exponent field. This field is used to break the various values into three major categories. If the exponent field has all of its bits set to one, then the value represented is either an infinity or an an. If the exponent field has all of its bits cleared to zero, then the value is either a zero or a subnormal. Any other value in the exponent field means that the value being encoded is a normal number. Finally, we have the significant field. For normal numbers and subnormal numbers, this field contains the value which gets scaled by the exponent. The IEEE standard specifies a collection of operations which need to be supported. I wanted to start with something easy, and it appeared to me that the easiest arithmetic operation to implement for floating point numbers is multiplication. For the 16-bit floating point format, also known as half precision, the exponent field is 5 bits wide, the significant field is 10 bits wide, adding in the sign bit brings us to the 16-bit total for this format. Using modern digital circuit design technologies is more like writing software than building hardware. One useful side effect of this is that we can write function routines once and reuse them as needed. Verilog refers to these routines as modules. Since two operands are input to the multiplication operation, and we need to classify the type of both operands, the first module which needs to be built will perform the task of classifying floating point values. I call this first module HP class. Here HP stands for half precision. This module outputs six values, SNAN, QNAN, infinity, zero, subnormal, and normal. Each of these return values is encoded as a single bit. The module will determine which of these six categories the value falls into, set the corresponding return value to one, and the rest of the return values to zero. Some of you will have noticed I said earlier that the IEEE standard defines five categories for values, and yet the module will compute six return values. The IEEE standard actually defines two different kinds of NANDs, which is why the HP class module will return six different flags. The two kinds of NANDs are signaling NANDs and quiet NANDs. What does a NAND look like? If you remember, it was mentioned earlier that if the exponent field of a floating point value has all of its bits set to 1, that the value might be an AN. The other condition which must occur is that the significant field must have at least one bit set to 1. Stated another way, the significant of a NAN will never be 0. The half precision format uses 10 bits for its significant. Numbering the least significant bit of the floating point value as 0, the significant bits are 0 through 9. If the most significant bit of the significant is cleared to zero, then the NAN is a signaling NAN. At least one of the remaining bits, zero through eight, must be set to one. Other than that, the value of bits zero through eight can be completely arbitrary. As you might have guessed, a quiet NAN has the most significant bit of its significant set to one. Since the most significant bit of the significant is one, Bits 0 through 8 may have any value, including all the bits cleared to 0. 
When all the exponent bits are set to 1, we have one more case. That case occurs when all the significant bits are cleared to 0. When this happens, the value stored is either positive infinity or negative infinity based on whether the sign bit is 0 or 1 respectively. Now let's look at the case when all of the exponent bits are cleared to 0. You may recall that I stated earlier that this means that the value is either 0 or subnormal. For the value to be 0, all of the bits of the significand must be cleared to 0. Again, like the infinities we just looked at, 0 can be either positive 0 or negative 0, depending on the sign bit. If the sign bit is 0, then we have positive 0. Otherwise, when the sign bit is 1, we have negative 0. When the exponent bits are all 0, and any bit in the significand is set to 1, the value is a subnormal value. We've seen that when the exponent field is all zeros or all ones that we have a special case. The exponent field of the half precision format has five bits, which means that the field can hold any value from 0 to 31. The exponent values of 0 and 31 are the special cases of exponents which are all zero or all ones respectively. Any other value for the exponent, that is any value from 1 to 30, means that the number represented is a normal number. This has run longer than I had hoped, so I'll postpone actually writing the HP class module until the next video. Please feel free to leave comments and questions below. Click like, please subscribe, and to make sure that you're notified when new videos arrive, click the bell. Thanks!